we're in the midst of a pandemic of a virus that hijacks the machinery of life itself, inserts its instructions in the uh, organism and makes it <clears throat> spread, spread those, those destructive instructions throughout the wider population. I'm speaking, of course, of the virus of altruism. Altruism is just like the coronavirus. It is a deadly infection that has nothing to offer, offer on its own but death, but it hijacks the living action of human beings and causes them, when they accept it, to act against their own life and then to spread this anti-life poison to others. <clears throat> now, the, the coronavirus pandemic is the result of altruism, not the existence of the virus, but of the, our inability to treat it, to have a vaccine against it, to have adequate hospital care. The main roadblock to the proper response to the virus and to being way ahead medically so that it wouldn't even be a threat in the first place is the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which I call the Federal Death Administration. Why is it altruism that is behind the FDA and its ability to strangle innovation, strangle testing that would occur if there were no FDA, testing by people just taking the drugs. What's the rationale for preventing you from taking a drug that you want to take? Well, if we let everybody take drugs on their own judgment, what about those people who would foolishly buy snake oil? What about the companies that would put out, knowingly put out shoddy drugs and fool people into again and again mindlessly buying them and injecting them into themselves? So to prevent the rational from acting on their rational judgment, the FDA, uh, sorry, the FDA prevents the rational from acting on their rational judgment in order to protect the irrational from the consequences of their own foolishness. Now, it's not a, a question of the wise and, and the ignorant, the informed and the ignorant, because if you're ignorant and rational, you consult those who are experts in the field. You consult your doctor if you know, well, gee, I don't know what a virus is. I don't know what I'm doing. I'll, I'll seek expert opinion. So being ignorant doesn't mean you're at risk. It's being foolish, being irrational. So the FDA and many other uh, nanny state agencies and laws that have impeded everything are based on the premise we have to protect the irrational and the fact that we sacrifice the rational is irrelevant. The need of the irrational, because they're irrational, is the standard of value. I go into this length because I, I realize that you need to know why we have to have a proof of the objectivist ethics. Why isn't it just an interesting thing for philosophers to know what the grounding is of an ethical code? Solving the so-called is-ought problem. The reason is that we don't have an implicitly right code that we're just trying to name the basis of. That would be true in ancient Greece. They were egoists. They didn't believe in sacrificing themselves in the classical era in ancient Greece. They had a healthy, man-loving, life-loving culture. But today, altruism is a scourge, is a virus, and it's in protection against that that we have to prove 
the objectivist egoistic philosophy. But there's a problem. To prove is to prove in logic, to appeal to reason. And everyone is convinced, beginning with the philosophers, that reason has nothing to say on basic moral issues. Reason is barred on principle from morality. This is the work of Hume and Kant, the two major philosophers here. Hume created an argument to show that you can't deduce norms, values, good from facts. And then Kant came in and said, we don't have to worry about that because we're in touch with values and morality through our sense of duty. We have an intuition of what the good is. Now, we know that that intuition was just the voice of their emotions, and their emotions were programmed by the ideas that they had accepted and automatized. And in the field of ethics, you generate most people, not us, I hope not me, accept the values that our parents and teachers, quote, inculcate us with, that they try to put into our minds. So Kant, being a dutiful son of a pietist mother, thought that his intuitions told him he had to do what the duty of religion was, to serve others and God, because God wants us to serve others. So in this way, religion became both the consequence of altruism and the supporter of altruism. There's a mutual reciprocal uh, uh, support of religion and altruism today. On the one hand, religion programs people to make them feel, if they accept the religious ethics, that altruism is self-evidently true. On the other hand, altruism makes them think there can't be any this worldly reason for this sacrifice, if it were just up to reason and logic, everything would be permitted. You remember the Dostoevsky character, if God is dead, then everything is permitted. So all the religious people who tell you, you have to have religion in order to have morality mean you have to have religion in order to have altruism because it's very clear you don't have to have religion to tell you not to chop off your finger. You don't have to have religion to tell you, uh, you, you shouldn't make yourself poor if you can make yourself rich. But you need religion if what you have to be told is give up what you love because there are others who need your services. So religion sustains altruism by commanding it, and altruism sustains religion by making people think the only morality, i.e. altruism, has to be based on a commandment from a supreme being. That's what Galt says. You do not need to return to morality, but to discover it but to discover it. And the genius of Ayn Rand is to take a fresh look at morality, to break out of what she called the frozen abstraction, that good equals self-sacrifice, that morality equals altruism, and realize that altruism is one theory of how man should live, but there are other theories. So how did she discover the objectivist ethics? She used the objectivist epistemology. And that's a challenge for us because people don't understand or use the objectivist epistemology. 
Well, they do to some extent. They do in their more rational fields, like in their career. Say if they're computer programmers, they're using it all the time. You can't build a computer program on the basis of feelings or faith or using variables that have not been defined or uh, package deals, invalid uh, use of variables or, or procedures. So in some ways, to some extent, everybody can think. It's not like everybody's the state of an academic philosopher who just can't put two and two together. Most people can, but they don't approach big questions like what is the good that way. In fact, they're rather frightened to approach a big question on their own at all. So the, I wrote down six things that the objectivist epistemology contributes and has to contribute to get to Ayn Rand's bringing in of reason to the proof of ethics. But I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to give you the essential. The essential that answers David Hume and makes Kant therefore irrelevant. Hume said it's impossible to deduce a value conclusion from strictly factual premises. And that is correct. But Ayn Rand identified the real method of proof, which is not deduction, but what she called reduction. Reduction is a process of tracing knowledge back to the observations through perception that enable you to reach it inductively. It's the reverse of induction. It's remembering what the steps of your induction, of your generalization from observation were. So let's go through that reduction because that will be the proof of the objectivist ethics. And I think a lot of uh, students of objectivism and even longtime objectivists don't fully get this. They don't fully get this proof. And I want to make it just unmistakably clear so that you get it and can communicate it, at least in outline. So we're trying to discover what is morality? What are the right standards of morality? So we begin with a neutral definition. Morality is a code of values to guide man's choices and actions. It's a guide to, chosen, to choosing actions. Now that's true for Christian morality. That's true for the objectivist morality. It's true for climate change, people, morality. Whatever your uh, values are, you can understand that the good is that which promotes those values. That's a guide that it tells you, do this, don't do that. Turn right, don't turn left. So that's just like the ante room to the ante room. The next question is that no one else asked, what are values? What are values? Morality is a guide to chosen values. What are values? Ayn Rand defined, uh, or at least characterized a value to open the discussion as that which one acts to gain and or keep. And said it presupposes answers to the question of value to whom and for what. Now, it was only this morning after 50 or 60 years, 53 years of studying this exact topic that I realized a fundamental truth about this uh, definition or characterization is of that which one acts to gain and or keep. And I want to share that with you to begin. This is a traditional way that ethicists approach it. There's something that's good, that's a value. It benefits some entity. And the question is, 
what is that value that will be good for that entity like the good is that which is beneficial to society that's where they would start right what is it to be a value or to be good it's to be valuable for society another view would be the good is that which keeps the planet from changing this is some intrinsic good that is served by various things out there in the world ozone layer bad that's a disvalue it's bad shouldn't be hunger bad bad for society uh shutting down production in order to save lives of the vulnerable good that's good for society right so you see the the orientation is off from the beginning the orientation takes values and and beneficiaries as revealed as just out there and we could argue about well is really value one beneficial to society or is it value two and then you have the argument of liberals versus conservatives cost benefit analysis and and um, tracing out well you know socialized medicine really doesn't help society or the lockdown how about this one the lockdown is costing more lives than it's saving which is true i think they start their analysis from the second part ayn rand starts from here you are you are confronting reality you have to make choices shall i eat this fruit or is it maybe bad to eat it maybe you're in the garden of eden asking that question or maybe you're hungry and you're a hunter gatherer asking that question or should i buy a pc or a mac to put it in a contemporary context so the the perspective that ayn rand has starts with that which one acts to gain and or keep and the little word one is so important i you know action i knew was the essence but one not society not the planet you what should you do that's the choice that you need morality to answer the question you need morality to answer to give you a guide in relation to so then once we start with that we can bring in if i can switch the now that's the circle that greg talked about my um probably going to bring in in this talk and this is the whole proof of the objectivist ethics right here this is a proof of egoism this is a proof that you live for yourself but what does it mean it means that you um, take actions and if the result of that action benefits you then that's a special kind of thing that's what we call valuing that's the issue that gives rise to morality and this is also life life is a process of taking in fuel and materials from the environment even for an amoeba taking in energy and materials from the environment processing them in a way that keeps you alive so the nature of life is self-sustaining action and even biologists have to define it that way as self-sustaining action this is a case of action that redounds on to the benefit of the agent qua agent of you as an acting being that's what i mean by benefit if you analyze benefit it comes down to there has to be something at stake you can't benefit the law of gravity 
you can't benefit something that is has no process of self-generated action going on. For instance, uh, suppose uh, uh, the earth warms. Does that benefit the earth to warm? No, because the earth isn't engaged in a process of action to achieve anything. If you say, well, wait a minute, it hurts the earth to warm. What's the basis of that? Why, why does it hurt the earth to warm and, and not to cool? Why isn't cooling bad? Why isn't stasis bad? What, there's no basis for saying this arrangement of matter is good for that arrangement of matter, and that arrangement of matter is bad for it. So like you have a, a deck of cards and you say, well, if they're shuffled in order, that's good for the deck. If they're shoveled out of order, that's bad. For no, that's ridiculous. It's, there's nothing good or bad in the arrangement of the cards, and there's nothing good or bad in the rearrangements of insentient, inanimate matter. So it's only the concept of life that makes the concept of value possible. A living organism is trying to sustain itself. Life is a process of self-sustaining action. It's action that produces results that keep the action going. This incidentally is why a virus isn't alive. A virus doesn't act. A virus gets acted upon by this machinery of the cell, but a virus does not take any action, and therefore being spread or not being spread makes no difference to it because there's nothing at stake. Now, the way Ayn Rand puts it shows the objectivist epistemology in action. Value is that which one acts to gain and or keep. The concept of value is not a primary. Whoa, it's not a primary? You mean there are primaries? What is that about? Other philosophers don't understand that or accept that. Aristotle did, but most other philosophers, particularly today, don't have such a category as concepts that are primary and concepts that depend upon other concepts. The concept value is not a primary. It presupposes an answer to the question of value to whom and for what. Now, the what for what is the benefit. If there's no benefit, then there's no for what. Then is an action that has a result, but you can't call that result good or valuable or beneficial or needed unless you're talking in terms of its effect on the life of the agent. Continuing, it presupposes an entity capable of acting to achieve a goal in the face of an alternative. Where no alternatives exist, no goals and no values are possible. Then she goes on to point out that the fundamental alternative behind all the lesser alternatives that generate values the fundamental value generating alternative is life versus death. It is only that, as I already kind of sketched in for you, that gives a point to action, that makes you able objectively to talk about benefit versus harm. Then she has the killer example, which is immoral and throws the whole point of everything she said into stark relief. You know, I'm a big advocate of thinking in examples. And this is one of history's great examples of thinking in examples. Quote, to make this point fully clear, try to imagine an immortal, indestructible robot, an entity which moves and acts, but which cannot be affected by anything, which cannot be changed in any respect, which cannot be damaged, injured, or destroyed. Now, she says, try to imagine, because you can't. It's contradictory. 
What about its source of fuel? For one thing, if it moves an ax, it has to have an energy supply to move an act. So the presence or absence of that fuel, the ability to replenish that fuel is, would be a, a major alternative. So you can't really make this plausible. It's to illustrate something. And you can't make it plausible that it can't be affected by anything. If it can't be affected by anything, then it can't move anything because of Newton's third law of action and reaction. And because the laws of thermodynamics require a heat transfer to the robot from anything it touches, if it's warmer or, than it or cooler than it. So it's physically impossible and you can't really carry it through. But suspending those doubts for the moment and you project a robot that does things, you will see that it cannot have any values. It faces no alternative. Therefore, it cannot have any goals or values. This circle can't exist. Instead, you instead of the um, thing going to action, going to value, and then value going back to agent, the arrows would go off in random ways. There is no such thing as the lower level. She says, let's take that away. Let's just say there's action and there's consequences. And you can build in a program to that robot if you want. So suppose it's programmed to go around damming up streams. Wherever it senses its, its you know, light receptors detect a, a stream of water, it starts grabbing stones and putting them in the way to dam up that stream. That's just what it's programmed to do. Is that good for the robot? No. Is that any different from if it were programmed to tear down those dams, to, to make streams that are clogged up somewhere flow freely? No, it's both of them are indifferent to the robot. Neither one can be beneficial. The fact that you could program it to do one thing and then suddenly turn around and do the opposite, making no difference to the robot by hypothesis in either case shows that it is not valuable to the robot to do something that has no impact on it. So the very concept of benefiting presupposes that you cannot benefit, that you can lose, that you can be harmed, that something can be lost and you act to gain and or keep it in the face of the possibility that you won't get it, and that the gain is a gain, a gain for you, the agent. So life is the fundamental condition, the fundamental alternative that gives rise to the existence of values. Some actions are self-perpetuating. Some actions are not. And of course, if you've got a living organism, the ones that are not self-perpetuating are harmful. Everything that a living organism does is either helpful or harmful. There's no such thing as breaking even because you need to build yourself up in case a literal virus comes along or other challenge to you. So stasis is a form of death. I mean, just running in place is not good enough. You have to grow. You have to enhance your abilities. And of course, psychologically, that's absolutely critical because consciousness is a difference detector. So the extent that you do the same thing over and over and over and over again, your mind dies. Your consciousness goes into an anodyne state where you're blissed out, as they say, but it's not a bliss, it's oblivion. So it's mental death, and metaphysically, it leads to actual death. Now let's just now talk about the egoism part. It's been egoism from the beginning. It's your life. We started with one. 
that one be you. You're the one who has to act. And this is where another tenet of objectivism that I haven't stressed comes in, volition, free will. The fact that you control your mind and therefore your own actions is what refutes collectivism. It means you're not part of society. You are a law unto yourself. You have to make yourself into a law unto yourself. If you choose to coast, you will coast with the crowd in almost all cases. So you have the power to define your own identity, to chart your own course, to pursue your own values. And morality tells you, if you do that, you need to know which of those values will help you in your effort to live and which will tend to kill you. They may not kill you tomorrow, but they put you on the road to death. The summary phrase for all this is that the agent's life, his own selfish life, is his ultimate value that all values that there are, the only values and all values are values because they promote your life, the life you choose. Life is the only end in itself. Why? Because it's sought for its own sake. The reason why you want to achieve is so that you can go on to greater achievements. The reason why you want to achieve values is to live a life of growing values, of setting higher standards and more demanding tasks so that you grow, you get better, you get stronger, you get wiser. So the only thing that is sought for its own sake, for more of itself, is life. Why do I say it's the only thing? Because that's the definition of life. Life is self-sustaining action, action sought in order to act again. Now, there's just one final wrinkle, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to questions. Uh, there's a distinction Ayn Rand makes that I haven't seen anywhere else, but it's, it's very realistic. That's a distinction between a purpose and a standard. The purpose, the ultimate value is your life. But you need a standard, a measuring stick, to tell you, well, what does advance my life? Just like if you want to build a skyscraper. You need the science of engineering to tell you what makes a skyscraper stand. How is it built? What goes into it? You can't just say, well, I want to build a skyscraper, so I'm going to take all the pro skyscraper actions right now, starting now. What are those? You need a science of what serves human life. Just like in medicine, you can't say, well, my goal is to be healthy, to have everything, all my organs functioning for my life. So I'm just going to do whatever is healthy. Well, what is healthy? You need a science of medicine based on the standard of man's health, of man's biological nature. And in morality, you need a standard based upon your fundamental nature, which is to be a, a human being who is a living organism. So the reason why we need a standard is psychoepistemological. We need it to guide our actions to the ultimate value. We know what we're after, but we need a compass. And the standard is that compass. The standard refers to man's life qua man only for only one reason, not because it's loftier, not because it's, it's abstract and isn't it good to be abstract. It's because everything about you that distinguishes you from a monkey is a consequence of that thing in you which thinks. It's the thinking part of you your nature is a rational being that is fundamental to you. And we learn about it through the science that studies what that 
the faculty is in some but any human being. So it's not like species oriented that makes us go to man's life qua man. All we're saying is just as medicine would look to the nature of human physiology, so ethics looks to the nature of man as a choosing acting being, the nature of a man, which is what you are. It gives the most information about you to help you guide your action. In the end, then, we have two moral codes, two uh, codes of values to guide man's choices and action, the morality of life and the morality of death. There's no middle ground. Who is not for life is against life. And the life that you're trying to live is your own. That's the egoism. That's selfishness. Thank you very much. I'll take questions now. Thank you, Harry. Um, while, while we transition to the questions, we're going to be joined also by Ankar Gatte. And in the meantime, Harry, you can turn off your screen sharing. I think uh, it'll be better experience for viewers to see uh, you and Ankar on screen. Does that do it? Yes, thank you. So Ankar, um, do you want to look through the questions and I can check in the chat uh, or for raised hands? Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can field the questions. Um, yeah, and if people want to raise, I think there's one raised hand, but let's take a written question first. So Harry, uh, here's a question that, that uh, on the issue of life as the standard. How does life being the, in now quote, warrant and the sanction, so some of the language I think from Anthem, integrate into all of this to what you were talking about? Warrant and sanction? That yeah. Part? yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is referring to what, the hero of Anthem says when he discovers the ego, I look for the warrant and sanction on my being. I need no warrant or sanction. I am the warrant and sanction of my being. That's an approximate quote from one of the most thrilling parts of Anthem. So how does that fit with life? It, it Hand in glove, that's saying, the only obligation you have, the only test that you have to face is that which you choose for yourself. There are no external commandments. You are not born in hock to some being or, or the planet or society. You own your own life to do with as you choose. Your life is yours. And the, um, what is the validation of that? The validation is seeing, well, what does obligation mean? We're saying there are no unchosen obligations. What does obligation mean? Does it mean anything? Maybe it's a taboo. Maybe we have, no, you know, if God is dead, everything is permitted. Maybe it's all myth. Maybe obligation is like prayer. It should, the hell with it, get rid of it. But you still have to do something by the law of causality if you want to get a certain goal. And I want in this connection to recommend in the highest possible terms, causality versus duty. Ayn Rand's statement of the metaphysical meaning of her proof uh, and the rejection of the concept of duty as an anti-concept. Now see, I talked about the epistemology as being fundamental. You can't get a contemporary thinker to say, oh yeah, I see, that's an anti-concept. That concept's invalid. There's no such thing as a concept that's invalid on their, in their system. It's not really system, in their hodgepodge of ideas. The idea of an invalid concept is, if not original to Ayn Rand, and, and no one else has ever said it, certainly sets her apart in 20th century and 21st century philosophy from everyone else. It's very hard to get people to reject package deals, stolen concepts, anti-concepts, because, well, people talk that way. That's all there is. People talk that way. Uh, can I ask you a follow-up on that, which is, so do you think 
the this perspective on those invalid concepts and so on, does that itself tie into her perspective on the fundamentality of life? So when she talks about it as, for instance, as tools of cognition, there's there's a heavy emphasis on how goal directed the whole process is. Absolutely, that is a very insightful thing uh, you're saying, um, which is an a, a, an idea I've come to. The immortal, indestructible robot could not have logic as well as could not have ethics. It could not have values, not because it doesn't care that there are contradictions, but that the idea of uh, unit economy and of the need to expand knowledge and the choices that you face, some of which are right and some of which are wrong in cognition, are of the same order as the choices of existential action. So yes, I definitely think that life versus death is a fundamental alternative for cognition as well as for values. Okay, let's try to take a live question here. Uh, so Brian McDaniel, you have your hand up. So let me see if I, I can allow you. Now you can unmute, you should be able to talk. Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, my question is, this might be a little bit off topic. It's a little further down. Um, but if you want to answer this, what is the reason that you can't shoot? Why, why can't you just say, well, I don't necessarily want to live my best life, but just good enough. So more than just barely surviving the minimum, what a life form needs to barely survive but yet not strive for your best possible life. So what, it, what makes you need to be consistent? Well, there's, there's two answers, maybe three. One is, it's the same as asking this. If I want to go to the garage, I'm now in my study in the back of the house. So I want to go to the raw garage. What's wrong with taking three steps towards the garage and then one step back from the garage? And then three steps towards the garage and one step back from the garage. What's wrong with it is your goal of getting to the garage condemns those backward steps. Now it's the same if you say, well, I think I'll take three steps and then just stand there for a while and then take another three steps and just stand there for a while. Boy, the things that I've missed in my life by not decisively acting when I had kind of decided I should, it's amazing. If you don't seize the opportunity, sometimes things vanish, uh, like a virus hits, and suddenly everything is shut down, and you could have done something great, but you didn't feel like being great. So that, on that level, it's evaluate, and let me put it metaphysically, evaluation is the uh, relating of the effects of action to a goal. That's what evaluate, to a value, evaluation. So you cannot evaluate by saying, well, I just don't want to act here. I, I want to act 80%. If you're going to evaluate, it you have to bring in life and the requirements of life and values. If you're not going to evaluate, then you don't bring it in and you die. Those are the only consistent alternatives. Psych that's on one level. That's metaphysically. Psychologically, no one would feel that way without a reason. And that reason is a psychological problem. It may not be a huge psychological problem, or it may be. I don't know. I couldn't say there's one kind of psychological problem. But if you think of a child, you think of a child of two or something. It doesn't start out with the attitude, well, I want cookies, but not a lot of cookies. I want to run, but not 
very fast. The pulling back from values has to be due to some fear, some doubt, some problem that is preventing the person from going all out. So psychologically, it's an emotion that has a cause and that causes a wrong idea. It's a mistake. It's an automatized mistake. So uh, those are two levels of answer to that. And I think probably the second is more personal. If you feel that way yourself, and sometimes I feel that way, it's really helpful to know that you can be liberated to wholeheartedly, passionately want things and get them and be thrilled by finding out what self-defeating belief is holding you back. Let's go back to a written, some written questions. And there's a couple about altruism, and you brought that up at the start of the talk. Um, so one is the, the question, this is from Ricardo, that I'll put, uh, I'll paraphrase it a little bit, that it's, you gave some contrast to, if you think of the earth, so the environmentalist kind of view, that like, why is warming bad for it and cooling uh, good, good or status good? So you're taking a non-living thing. If you think of altruism, it's for the sake of other people and they're living. Um, so do you want to, and you talked a little bit about how it's parasitical. Do you want to talk about that in relation to altruism? Yeah, two things. Uh, first, let's take it on its own terms before I get to the parasitical point. <clears throat> so philosopher A says, look, the fundamental alternative is the well-being of others. And this is not like the, the robot because there is something at stake. It's not it's for, for the person who's acting, it's not at, for, at stake. It's not an alternative he faces. It's an alternative other people face. What has it got to do with him? Why? It cannot cause him to act. And there's no basis. Remember how I said the robot could be programmed to pile up rocks to stop a stream or to unclog stream. And it's the same. You could have a theory of ethics, which is the death of the greatest number of other people is the ultimate good. What you should do is devote your life to killing as many people as you possibly can, hopefully by a long drawn out process of torture like Kant inflicted on us. So what is the difference? How do you say, well, no, that, that can't be but the other one can be. There's no way to distinguish except in terms of what causes action. The circle comes back to reinforce itself or it doesn't. That's an objective difference. That means that certain actions are caused by the relationship of the goal to the action. Others aren't. Uh, now the parasitical point is a very interesting point, I think. It gets to the fact that the concept of value rests upon the concept of life. So if you use the concept of value apart from your life, the life of the agent, you're stealing a concept. Now, stealing a concept isn't like stealing the cookies. It rend the, the cookies would have to dissolve in your hand if you stole them. The concept that's stolen becomes a meaningless sound. And the way to see that value severed from your life becomes a meaningless sound is to imagine trying to teach a child from birth that altruist theory of, of ethics. So he stubs his toe and cries and you say, oh, that's good. Uh, he, he gets a nice piece of ice cream and he eats it and he's delighted. Oh, that's bad. Isn't that bad? That's bad. The other is good. He would grow up thinking that bad means what we mean by good. You cannot teach the good is self-destruction except by trying to use the concept of good based upon what's good for you. That's how you, the only way you can learn the concept. If 
you become aware through the experience of pleasure and pain of things that are for you and things that are against you. And it doesn't matter whether you use the word good or guten or anything else, bad, blach, whatever. If it means that, like ice cream, then I want to get it, right? So the altruist code, it says, value the renunciation of your values, value the destruction of your values for the sake of someone else, cannot really make sense of it, except if they're secretly counting on, it'll really be good for you in the end, which is the only kind of good there is. And the, the other question on altruism, and it actually relates to what you brought up at the end, is, this is from Andrew, how does objectivism contrast with altruism on the issue of pleasure slash pain? Well, objectivism holds that pleasure and pain is the, if we're talking about bodily, first of all, you distinguish bodily sensations from emotional joy and suffering. The bodily sensations of pleasure and pain are universal, dictated by your nervous system, have been selected in evolution to lead you toward what benefits your life. So you like ice cream, that feels good on your tongue. I mean, it tastes good. It's a pleasure bodily. And cutting yourself with a knife or hitting your thumb with a hammer feels bad, damage to your body hurts and makes you want to avoid it, right? So in a, any organism bo born with different genetic programming would soon die. So natural selection has made pleasure and pain be the signals of the immediately pro-life and the immediately physically anti-life. Now, you have to go to the dentist. I mean, you don't have to, but there's a value in going to the dentist, even though it may hurt. But that in the short run, it is damaging the things that give you the pain signals. Only it's like having a cancer cut out. It's for the greater long-term good of you. So um, the pleasure and pain are the stand-ins in consciousness at the beginning for life versus death. But then you go on, and the thing that impressed me here as to how you go on and what it means to go on for bodily sensation was uh, the child of the Berliners who I watched develop from birth, is now a big lawyer at the Institute for Justice and I'm very proud of, Dana Berliner. When she was three months old, she began to smile when she saw the milk bottle approaching. She had learned that that good feeling that she had from the drinking the milk came from that bottle, that entity, right? So she would, on the perceptual level, and associated that thing with that look for that pleasure. So that is like the first thing beyond just what's immediately stimulating a sense organ. This is a connection that's made through association. And then the associations become conceptual. And you know that, oh, uh, going to school, even though it, well, she went to Montessori school, so she loved it. So she couldn't wait to go to school and she was sad when they had vacation because it was a Montessori school and she had her project. So you understand that something on the conceptual level, something that's not in front of your face, leads to the pleasure and the enjoyment. Then a lot of what we get pleasure from, uh, emotional joy from, not the bodily sensation of play, is efficacy. Why do kids want to win at games? Because it, me, it gives them a sense of efficacy. I can do it. Any skill that you master expands your range of action and therefore enables you to get more of what you want and keep away from the things you don't want. So a lot of what we as adults are motivated by is symbolic um, uh, 
things that are symbolic of greater efficacy. The whole realm of art is about the world that's right for me, the world that fits my metaphysical value judgments, and that says to me, I'm right, and I know how to live, and I can live, and I can succeed. I am efficacious in that world. Uh, so there's a tremendous psychological dimension having to do with skill building and mastery and efficacy and being right for reality, being a capable person. But it all begins in enjoying that milk and feeling bad when you don't have it on the physical sensation level. Uh, okay, great. Let's try another uh, live question. So, I mean, not written question. So Rajnish, you have your head, hand up. I can allow you to talk and then you need to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Harry, for an excellent presentation. I wanted to ask, you know, for both myself and I'm a psychiatrist, so for my patients and for myself both, you, we, we, even if we are clear about what our values are, the problem all, and the difficult, you know, where the difficulty is how to balance competing values. How can reference to the standard of value help us to allocate, you know, uh, the time and the effort uh, appropriately to the different values that we have. It's always the struggle between the values. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to emphasize what is you're saying is, is competing values, not values and disvalues. You can't weigh values and disvalues, I've learned from my wife's work in psychopistemology. You have to make it value versus value. And the key there is central purpose. The key is you have one major priority and the other things are after that, come after that. That usually it's your work. It kind of has to be your, your work. It may not be a regular career, but you can't sacrifice your work to something else. You won't be happy. You won't have a major purpose. Um, but there is a task of prioritizing. There is a uh, skill. There is uh, a, um, a list of questions, well, not a list, but a set of questions that you need to ask yourself because time is limited. So if you are talking about how do you get all the good things in, that's a great place to be. That's a great place. I got so many, more. I was thinking that just the other day. There's so many wonderful things that I want to do. I won't listen for you, but they were listed, some of the top ones are listed in my mind. And I don't have unlimited time. I've just got to choose the ones that are most important. You rank them hierarchically. But many times people think that they have to balance the values and the disvalues, and that is a wrong approach. And for details, see my wife's forthcoming book. Here's a written question that I think is, is uh, related to that. So it's how do you define the concept of time in the context of seeking values? Well, I mean, how do I define time? It's a measure of the motions that you put in to get your values. Uh, but I mean, we measure it the same way we measure other things. We use time, Ayn Rand says to measure values. I think maybe that's what the question is referring to. Time is the metric that we use, and that reminds me of a point I wanted to make in the last question. Time is a metric we use to measure the strength of our values. How much time would I be willing to put in on this versus on that? Uh, I like tennis a lot. I'm not willing to put in the total amount of time I would need to to become good instead of uh, 
which is the level of the technical term for the level I'm at now. But I am willing to put that time in on writing a book on the philosophy of mathematics, on building even deeper my relationship with my wife, on uh, music, which has always been a high value of mine. So there's certain things I am willing to put some time in. Now, the, the qualification or the additional point I wanted to make is there's marginal utility here if you know that concept from economics. So uh, you have a, a need for romantic love, but that doesn't mean you cut out all your friends and you just want your spouse and nothing but your spouse all the time because she's your highest uh, personal you know, value that in the friendship and love area. Sometimes an hour spent with a friend ranks higher than the 15th hour of the day with your spouse, even though your spouse ranks above the friend. So there is an issue of what economists call marginal value here. And you shouldn't feel guilty that what, how come, how come I want to read some book other than Atlas Shrugged? You know, if that's the, the best book and it is, uh, shouldn't I just always be rereading that? But you've read it 10 times before. You'll get more value, but you'll get even more value if you read, oh, uh, Greg made reference, I think, to The Scarlet Letter of Nathaniel Hawthorne, a great book. Uh, there are other great books to read. And even, you know, entertaining books that aren't great to read. Sometimes you, you know, after you've eaten steak for a while, beans is gonna taste fine. You know that song? That is true. Consciousness is a difference detector. It needs change. It needs contrast to keep things alive. Another written question. This is from Zemoit. This, and it goes to back to earlier in the talk. Can you elaborate on why we departed from the ancient Greeks and from their implicit egoism? Yes and no. Uh, Yes, the influence of Plato beat out the influence of Aristotle. Plato imported into Greek thought Oriental mysticism, despotism, the uh, philosophy of the Greeks' mortal enemies that they fought those battles at, at, at uh, Thermopylae and uh, Marathon and so forth, the, the Persians. So one picture is of salaming in front of the holy emperor. And that came from the East. And the other is the proud Greek god who knows no limit to his achievement. And Plato's brought in in a convincing way. And that's the, that's the key to understanding how evil philosophies get put across. They make plausible arguments and they capitalize on incomplete cases made by the good guys. Now, Plato was before Aristotle, but it was, for some reason, I don't know, too late when Aristotle wrote. So it was only a thousand years later that people got what Aristotle was teaching. And Plato brought in Christianity. Plato was still an egoist. Plato did not say sacrifice for the good of others. He said, if you follow your collectivist assigned role, you will have an integrated soul. You, you will be better off. That's the whole message of the Republic. It's in your interest to be a cog in the wheel, cog in the machine. So he was still an egoist, but he, he laid the groundwork for uh, the Stoics who took Greek culture further. And then the Christians just snapped it up from the Stoic malevolence and offered salvation. So it's, the question is why did the culture not accept Aristotle? And I don't have an answer for that, but they accepted Plato. Uh, here's another question that brings up something you brought up in the in, in your talk with the, the example you called it a killer example i think of the immortal robot from the objectivist eth ethics so the question is uh, this is from lisa what if the robot had emotions 
the circle would apply, wouldn't it? Great. I meant to say that. If the robot can be pleased or hurt emotionally or otherwise, and some affect, it has some affective state because of what it does, it's not that robot. This is a robot that cannot be affected by anything. It cannot be changed, altered, hurt, pleased. Nothing means anything to it. If you put in a meaning and say, well, it, it likes certain things, well, then you have a valuing uh, being. Now, in fact, I don't think you can bring in what is an evolved survival adaptation, namely the pleasure pain mechanism of consciousness, into an insentient being. But we're, you know, we're playing science fiction anyway. So, yeah, if you, if you give it a stake, if you say its fundamental alternative is joy or suffering, then you have a basis for valuing. Only it, it wouldn't be life, it would be joy versus suffering. So that, that departs from the example. Um, maybe I'll ask this, as I, I, we have two minutes left, I think. Um, th this point you made about thinking in examples, and it's a killer example, then you stressed, well, this is, the immortal robot is sort of a thought experiment that you can't literally have an example of it. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? The, how you think about that? That it's an example, but it's not a realistic example? Yeah, it doesn't have to be a real example. Um, if you want a real example, uh, you can give a real, but, but let me talk on a higher level first. I had never thought about that. I had never thought about the question you're raising, which is what is the difference between an impossible thought experiment as an example and a real example? Um, I think the thought experiments are easier to work with because they're streamlined. You, you're leaving out so many things. Uh, whereas um, a real example, particularly one from your own experience, carries a lot of rich association and connotations, and it can be sometimes hard to see the essence. But a thought experiment deals only in the essentials. Uh, but they're both concretes that you can trace out the consequences of things with. And what was the other uh, aspect of that? I thought there was another part. Uh, no, it no. was, but it slipped out of my mind. So we'll move on. Okay, I think we're at time. Yeah, I think Alan's coming back on. Thank you, Harry, so much for the question and that period and for the talk. Thank you, Ankar, for moderating. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, Harry, in the in the chat, there's been a lot of favorable comments and thank yous from people. Uh, people really appreciated this uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. To help keep content like this free, consider supporting ARI by becoming a member at einrand.org forward slash membership.